work report and has led reviews into the culture at Parliament House, universities and gymnastics. Kate Jenkins with today's National Press Club Address. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra and today's Westpac Address. I'm the club's president, Laura Tingle. In early 2020, a lengthy report by our speaker today was released by the Human Rights Commission. It came two years after the explosion of the Me Too movement around the globe and two years after the Commission's extensive survey which showed that one in three people in Australia had experienced sexual harassment at work in the past five years, including two in five women. Kate Jenkins said in the report that she was delivering it with a sense of urgency and hope. There is an urgency for change, there is the momentum for reform, she said. Yet 12 months later, the report's recommendations would still be languishing as the stories of Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins tore through the Australian public conscience. This week, the legislation to implement the recommendations of Kate Jenkins' report went through the parliament. Please welcome Kate Jenkins to address us today. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome, Laura, and thank you to the National Press Club for having me here today and also acknowledging the dignitaries that are in the room as well as everyone here. I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambari people, and pay my respect to their elders past, present and future. I also acknowledge and pay tribute to my colleague, Commissioner June Oscar, who in her landmark project, We Aniu Thugani, has elevated the voices of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander women and girls. And I also want to acknowledge all the people who've experienced discrimination, harassment and inequality. I'm sorry that our laws have failed to protect you. I've listened closely and you have changed me. Together, I believe we can build on the work of those who have come before us and change our country. And I want to acknowledge my mother, who is here today with my husband, Ken, for passing down to me through her DNA and through her and my father's values, my deep commitment to fairness, equality, and the Carlton Football Club. <laughs> I'll be talking about sex discrimination and sexual harassment today, and this can cause discomfort and distress. If my speech creates those feelings for you, please take care of yourself as you need. For example, for those in the room, if you need to take some time out from this space, there's a quiet room you can head to upstairs. You can also seek support by calling 1800 RESPECT and find information about supports and your rights at respectatwork.gov.au. Six years ago, I was appointed as Australia's seventh sex discrimination commissioner. I was the first employment lawyer in the role, and as a, the majority of complaints to the commission relate to employment, this seemed like a good fit. One of my first tasks, day three of the job actually, was to come here to the National Press Club and outline what I wanted to achieve. I remember feeling a bit nervous. I was a seasoned employment lawyer. I'd served as Victoria's Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commissioner. I wasn't new to public speaking and I was relatively used to media, but I knew the media were absolutely critical to the work of change. And in this you bear an important responsibility. I talked then about what had inspired me that made young women like me believe we had bright futures and an equal chance. In a world where everything was possible, where things had really changed, particularly for women. I spoke about the impact on me and others of the first discrimination case to reach the High Court. A pilot named Deborah Laurie, who took on Ansett Airlines and its powerful owner, Reg Ansett, when they refused to let a woman fly their planes. It was 1979, I was 11, and Deborah Laurie won her case. In that first speech, I outlined my priorities, address gender-based discrimination and violence in all forms, work to improve women's economic security, and pursue diversity in leadership. 
In 2016, many of the critical foundations needed to protect people from sexual harassment and sex discrimination and to advance gender equality, they were already in place. We had legislative frameworks. We had policies. However, I've never been a lawyer's lawyer. I'm a really practical person. And so my motivation in taking on this role was to bring the law to life. For everyone, it was intended to help, to harness those laws and policies we had to create sharper, workable practices and focused actions that would change people's behaviours. To do that, we needed not just the support and engagement of legislators, policy makers, courts and HR departments, we needed everyone to engage. We needed everyone to care. So we had to reach people where they lived, worked, played and learned. Because this is where discriminatory behaviours are learned and perpetuated, but also where new norms can be adopted, where behaviours can change. The Change the Story framework calls these policies high impact settings for change. And I planned to focus on workplaces, on education, and because we're Australia, on sport. Six and a half years later, I'm coming close to the end of my term as Commissioner and it has been a huge privilege. Today I want to offer some reflections on where we are now in terms of gender equality and sexual harassment in Australia and where I believe we're going next. To do this, I'm going to touch down at three points in time, 50 years ago, five years ago and today to show why I believe right now we're at a key inflection point in the trajectory of this change, one that fills me with optimism. Optimism that if community engagement remains high, and I believe it will, then five years from now, we will see the equality and fairness that our laws are actually designed to bring will have come to life. And you know what? It's about time. 50 years ago was a period of intense activism and enormous social change, particularly for women. As Wendy McCarthy reminded me recently, one of the biggest springboards for women's advancement was progress made on reproductive rights. The contraceptive pill arrived in 1961 and a decade later, the Whitlam government removed the luxury tax it carried and listed the pill on the PBS. Women from all socioeconomic groups could now avoid unwanted pregnancy and they could plan for parenthood. Of course, education was another major cornerstone of women's advancement and that didn't happen overnight either. In 1950, less than one in five university students were women. By 1980, it was closer to half. As women flocked to paid work, critical workplace rights were enshrined in policy and legislation, and they remain today. 1972 was a particularly big year for reform. There was progress on equal pay, childcare, paid maternity leave, and pregnancy discrimination. But it was clear we needed laws, binding laws that could protect people from a whole range of discriminatory behaviours and unfair systemic practices. The women's electoral lobby was set up in 1972 as well to influence government, public policy and public institutions. The late, great and very honourable Susan Ryan was a founding member and she and this group helped to create and maintain the massive momentum needed to withstand the heavy tide of history. Luckily for me, Susan was Age and Disability Discrimination Commissioner when I joined the, joined the Human Rights Commission in 2016. Ever gener generous with her time, she told me the challenges she'd faced, the abuse she'd endured, and the pragmatic compromises she'd made to get the Sex Discrimination Act over the line in 1984. Susan was my inspiration for developing the traits that I've applied every day in this role, pragmatism, persistence and patience. One thing that surprised and really disappointed her was that even decades after, in, decades after introducing the Sex Discrimination Act, there was still no direct requirement for employers to comply with the Act 
as she had originally envisaged. She felt the lack of an employer duty or a positive duty in the Act was unfinished business, but more about that later. Over those 50 years then, we'd made some really significant and really important progress in addressing discrimination and gender inequality. And when you look at what drove that progress then, there was very periods of very broad community engagement from everyone, including men. Advocacy was highly strategic and evidence-based. There was real political commitment. And consequently, we saw a range of profound legal policy and social changes that are still in place today. Does it sound familiar? So I'm going to now jump forward to uh, Thursday, October the 5th, 2017, five years later, five years ago. I'd been in the job for about a year and a half and my team and I had been working hard and along the lines we'd mapped out. But for me, that was the day that changed everything in a way that was both profound and fundament fundamental to what has happened since. I stepped off an international flight home and, as you do, turned on my phone. It lit up like a Christmas tree. The New York Times had just published its explosive report on Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Shocking allegations of abuse, sexual harassment and serious cover-ups going back decades. Now, Hollywood is a very long way from here. But in the days, weeks and months that followed, it became clear that something had changed in Australia. The conversation about sexual harassment underwent a seismic shift. From a reluctant but resigned acceptance that this kind of behaviour, this kind of abuse, was an undesirable but somehow inevitable part of the working environment, to a sharper, angrier realisation that these behaviours were not and should never be considered inevitable, and they had to stop. Enter hashtag MeToo. The MeToo movement hit Australia like a tsunami, as it did many other countries. People were angry. They started talking and talking, openly sharing their experiences of sexual harassment, fear, frustration and inequality. Like many others in leadership positions, I knew instantly we had to respond to this mood change, and quickly. This was the moment to jump into the riptide and go with it. We immediately sought support from government to expand our 2018 National Survey on Workplace Sexual Harassment to include data by industry for the first time. In 2018, I reported on those results in my second address to this room, and I'll shortly share with you some of the 2022 survey results which we released today. I also advocated to government for us, as the National Human Rights Institution, to conduct a much deeper examination into workplace sexual harassment. The former Minister for Women, Kelly O'Dwyer, and then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull offered support, including a useful analysis of the economic impacts of sexual harassment. Spoiler alert, it was costing the nation a fortune. Our 18 month long comprehensive inquiry examined the nature, prevalence, impacts and cost of sexual harassment in our workplaces. Now, I'd been a sexual harassment specialist lawyer for 25 years, but what hit me hardest was hearing the extent to which people's lives were being ruined by sexual harassment despite the laws we had. We heard that the system, which relied so heavily on complaints as the primary mechanism to enforce the law and drive behavioural change, was not working. We heard that sexual harassment was a systemic, harmful and extremely costly problem which would require action from everyone, government, employers, communities and individuals if we really wanted to change. What had been achieved over the previous 50 years, very considerable and very significant, but it wasn't enough. I believe as a society, we'd allowed the momentum to build up over the 60s, 70s and 80s, and then to slowly ebb away. 
because the behaviours, well, it seemed they hadn't really changed much at all. Throughout our inquiry, there was one theme that rose up again and again as we listened to and learned from people's lived experiences of the nation's workplace. A universal desire, not just to feel and be safe at work, but to be treated with respect. Respect. So that's what we called it. Our Respect at Work report, with its 55 recommendations, was tabled in the Federal Parliament on the 5th of March 2020. It was a proud day for me and my team, but it was also the last day that Federal Parliament sat before COVID-19 swept the country. So we had a report. We had 55 carefully considered recommendations, but we still had to land the plane. I had to draw on all my reserves of persistence, pragmatism and patience. As it turned out, the Me Too movement was unstoppable even in the face of a pandemic. Sexual harassment and gender inequality remained major topics of national conversation. In fact, they were fuelled and amplified by wave after wave of single events and pivotal moments. Just a few. The apology delivered by six, delivered, sorry, two six senior associates, former associates by the Chief Justice of the High Court for sexual harassment by a former High Court judge. The backlash from AMP staff and shareholders that's changed expectations of CEOs and boards around sexual harassment. Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, introducing her mantra, let's make some noise and inspiring others. Chanel Contos, called for young people to share their school age experiences of sexual harassment and sexual assault. And there have been other high profile cases as well as we know. And across the country, the March for Justice protests drew hundreds of thousands into the streets with placards like my favourite that said, hashtag implement the 55. <laughs> a clear expression of the national desire for a fundamental change in attitude and for action. The amount of new and meaningful discussion and action that's taken place since the day the New York Times published has been remarkable. With community expectations now very high, in April last year, the Morrison government responded to all 55 recommendations in our Respect at Work report and implementation work began in earnest, including legislating half the statutory recommendations we made and establishing the Respect at Work Council. Some members I know are here today. I knew my next task was to keep the momentum going so the remaining recommendations could become a reality, particularly the positive duty recommendation that was so long overdue. And in May this year, the new Albanese government was elected carrying the commitment to implement the 55. So that brings me to where we are today and why I'm so optimistic about change. Now, like we saw 50 years ago, in a climate of high community expectations, we're seeing big changes to laws and policies to advance respect and equality in the workplace. And credit here, particularly to the Minister for Women, Minister Gallagher, and the Minister for Employment, uh, Minister Burke, for their work. Backed by clever advocacy and strong, a strong evidence base, the 55 uh, Respect at Work recommendations are funded and many are well progressed under the leadership of the attorney and his department. And some of that team that has been with me are here today as well on the journey. The significant reforms made to safe work guidance, the Sex Discrimination, Fair Work and Workplace Gender Equality Acts are game changers in my view. They have the power to transform a response driven system to one in which employers have their eyes firmly fixed on prevention of sexual harassment and discrimination. Until now, employers were only held accountable if a victim of sexual harassment complained and could prove they'd been, been harassed. It was easy for workplaces to assume that if there were no complaints, there was no harassment. But 20 years of prevalent surveys by the Human Rights Commission tells us a very different story. 
Because of the laws stewarded through the Parliament by the Attorney Mark Dreyfus and passed on Monday, employers will now have a positive duty to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate sexual harassment. Measures that can work for big corporates and for the smallest of enterprises. These laws are not being introduced in isolation. Earlier this month, we launched the respectatwork.gov.au website, a central source of free information and accessible practical resources providing clear guidance for employers and for individuals. With contributions from across the Respect at Work Council members, it includes the most current expertise with more to come as employers ready themselves for their new duties. It even includes a new media reporting guidelines launched by Minister Rishworth and Our Watch today. So I'm pleased today to launch the results of the 2020 Two National Survey on Workplace Sexual Harassment. The report, Time for Respect, is now up on our website. We called it Time for Respect because after five decades, and now particularly after the last five years, isn't it time for respect? The results provide a measure of where Australian workplaces are with regard to sexual harassment precisely at what I believe is the next inflection point in our progress towards safer and more respectful workplaces. It shows us where we are now after the anger, activism and action of the last five years and where we can get to if we use the tools we now have at our disposal, the newly updated laws, the new educational initiatives, the new supports, the new resources, and the new attitudes. All the improvements recommended by the Respect at Work report are there to help. And if we use them and use them wisely over the next five years, respect will become business as usual. It'll be just how we do things. Disappointingly, since 2018, not much has changed in terms of behaviours in many of our workplaces. A third of Australians still experience sexual harassment in the workplace, 41% of women and 26% of men. The highest rates of sexual harassment are still young people, LGBTQI plus people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and people with disabilities. It's happening face to face and online and most harassment is still perpetuated by men. Less than one in five people who'd experienced sexual harassment reported it, so still way too low. And either they thought it wasn't serious enough or it was easier to keep quiet. Of those who did report, 40% said nothing changed. So we have to learn from this data because it not only shows that there's more work to do, but it shows where the work needs to be done. I'm especially worried about about how little has changed for our new job entrants. Almost half of workers under 30 have experienced sexual harassment in the last five years. The industries where young people tend to start their working lives are accommodation and food services, retail and arts and recreation. Three of the five worst performing industries in terms of incidents of sexual harassment. So the survey figures are telling us that in these settings, frankly, things are still not good enough. To support the needs of young workers, the Commission has created tailored training specifically targeting young workers, which is now accessible for free on the respectatwork.gov.au website. And it's also why I focused my attention on university and school students, including co-leading a survey project on sexual harassment and consent education in schools with the National Children's Commissioner, Anne Hollands, who is here today, and also with the support of Chanel Contos. This year, for the first time in our survey, we asked workers how they felt their organisations were dealing with sexual harassment. And I think employers will find their answers illuminating. So the good news is that almost three quarters of workers think their organisation 
their organisations are genuinely committed to workplace to a workplace free from sexual harassment. The bad news is that only a third had attended training on sexual harassment. Only around two thirds of workers said their organisation has a sexual harassment policy, and only half said their organisation provided information to workers about how to report. The promising news is that almost half of workers said their line managers had shown leadership in preventing and responding to sexual harassment. And knowing how important those line managers are, I really want to see more of that. So while there's movement and clearly momentum, a lot of workplaces still need to lift their game. But we're not at a standing start. I've talked about the respect of work reforms, I've talked about the survey results. Now I want to talk about workplaces. Given the systemic nature of sexual harassment, one of our recommendations was to support industries to address sexual harassment. And since 2017, my team have worked with media and entertainment, mining, retail and hospitality, universities, law, sport, finance, defence, police and border force. And I've seen in these industries a completely new attitude and approach to sexual harassment, bullying and disrespect. Rather than hide it, the best employers want to stop it. Personally, the change I'm witnessing in our parliament gives me the greatest hope. A year ago today, our independent review of Commonwealth Parliamentary Workplaces report set the standard was tabled in the parliament. It was a privilege to lead that review and hear the experiences of more than 1,700 participants. The Parliament committed to all 28 recommendations and I'm inspired by the real action that I've been seeing. Just yesterday, I met with the cross-parliamentary leadership task force that are leading and oversighting the reforms. And I'm pleased that many of its members are here today and the ones who couldn't come sent their apologies. And I also acknowledge the other parliamentarians in the room today, which is a really great sign for all of us. The Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards released their report on pro proposed behaviour standards and codes yesterday as well. And this morning, the presiding officers made opening statements marking the one year anniversary of the report in both the House and the Senate. They spoke about setting the standard for all workplaces and I was privileged to be in the House this morning for that statement and the reason I'm leaving quite promptly is to return for two o'clock to attend the Senate for question time. But what inspires me most when I visit Parliament House is the response I'm getting, the quiet comments made in passing, people dropping back to talk to me, before and after meetings, in lifts and in corridors, from political staffers, journalists and department staff, saying thank you for your work and saying it is and feels different here now. The work of change is hard and we need to remember it's painful for those with lived experience. However, with continued action and vigilance against complacency, I believe our parliament is well placed to become the safe, respectful and diverse workplace we need it to be. So these were all the kind of high impact settings for change that we needed to reach. And I'm pleased to say we got to quite a few over my term as commissioner. The Harvey Weinstein saga and many others like it have shone a very bright light on the toxicity of silence and on how secrecy can perpetuate abuse. I've seen a notable shift over the last five years from secrecy towards transparency. The Respect at Work Council will soon release federal guidance recommending the limited use of confidentiality clauses in sexual harassment settlement agreements. We know workplaces are safer and risks are reduced when organisations share and use industry data, trend analysis and de-identified statistics. The pay gap reporting and ban on pay secrecy is also welcome developments. So much is out in the open now in so many of our workplaces 
there can be no turning back. So drawing on the lessons and outcomes of the last 50 years and building on the momentum generated over the last five, I believe we are at a turning point. As I said earlier, I think our progress in tackling sex discrimination and sexual harassment and gender inequality slowed right down because we relied too much on the system to deliver the change we wanted. We didn't understand that it's up to us to change. We relied too heavily on the courage of victims to step into the brutal and lonely glare of the spotlight to enforce the law. We cannot allow that to continue. It's too painful, too damaging, too expensive. And above all, it's not fair and it's not respectful. We have a roadmap now, the future that includes a positive duty in workplaces and a society that's demanding transparency, accountability and action. Clearly, the job is not done yet, and I will continue to contribute wherever I can after I leave the Commission next April. I will still be pragmatic. I will always be persistent. But as for being patient, <laughs> the time for patience is over. I want to see people's lives improve. For women, for people of all genders. I want them to be given the respect and equality that they deserve. The time for change is now. We've done the work and the planning. We have the legal and policy changes in place. We're developing the resources and tools. We have media attention and our politicians are engaged. We have possibly the highest level of community-wide awareness on these issues since the 60s and 70s. We have motivated employers and workers and the next generation is coming through with high expectations and we all have a role to play. So let's just get this done. We need more courageous leaders so that fewer survivors are forced to speak out because the system has failed them. We need trauma-informed systems in which people feel safe to speak up, knowing they will be listened to with compassion and supported. And we need to make space for more diverse voices. And four years from now, when the results of the next national survey on sexual harassment in workplaces come out, maybe in this room, I want to see the outcomes of change reflected in the data, telling us that the laws have been effective, that behaviours have changed, and that workplaces and lives are the better for it. About a month ago, I decided to track down Flight Captain Deborah Laurie. So remember her? I'd never met her before, actually, and I arranged to meet her for coffee and we talked for two hours. She is incredible. In 2020, she celebrated 50 years of flying aircraft. She was inducted into the Australian Aviation Hall of Fame. She still works as a pilot today, which is why she is not here and she's still flying. Thank you. You told me! <laughs> you told me exactly that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to I'm just going to say I've been warned by about 10 people. Do, when you get off, don't fall over. Don't so. fall off this time. Yes. I'm never going to sit here. But it's stay up there. Yes, stay up there. <laughs> yes, we'll all be very nervous yes. afterwards. Um, <laughs> um, look, thank you so much uh, for your address and uh, congratulations on all you've achieved um, during your time in the job. Um, I, I suppose I'd like to ask you uh, to start with... Um, uh, given all of those changes um, in the legislation uh, and all the things you've put in place and the change in the na nature of the conversation, did you feel a bit of a twinge of disappointment when you looked at the figures in, uh, that you've just outlined today in the new report? Uh, why do you think they're not showing any really material change yet? And how important will that positive duty be, do you think, in possibly 
getting those better figures you're hoping for in four yes. years' time. Yes. Um, the statistics are disappointing, but they didn't surprise me at all because whilst we've had lots of momentum and conversations, most of those changes that are happening are happening right now that we've been working really hard to make sure the resources and the information. We know some workplaces have engaged, but we know with the positive duty, and there's 12 months for employers to ready for that, that there is a lot more new expertise and information that's needed. So I didn't expect them to change, actually. I think the fact that we're talking about this doesn't mean that workplaces have changed uh, yet. Uh, but I, that's why this conversation about 50 years ago to now, actually, we've done this before, the momentum. So I think in terms of the ingredients for actual change, you're looking at uh, the laws that support. So I'll talk to the positive duty, but the laws that point us all in the right direction. And my realisation as an employment lawyer is that they hadn't been. Um, you need leaders who lead, you need um, diverse voices in the conversation, you need to get rid of the secrecy, and you actually need more than the HR department worried about this. Um, and so all of the conversation, all those ingredients are there now. Um, the reason, and there are 55 recommendations, so there's a whole lot of things that are going on, but the reason that the positive duty is so important is that unbe uh, unknown to most people. The Sex Discrimination Act said sexual harassment is unlawful and if it happens you can complain. It didn't say employers need to make sure that your workplaces don't have sexual harassment. Now employers don't want sexual harassment and I think that's why not only have workers but workplaces and employers have been really accepting and positive about this change is the realisation that the focus had really been about making sure people didn't complain whereas the new focus will be about making sure sexual harassment stops. And so that's, it's just a shift and it's not like employers have been doing nothing. I just feel like their focus has been about complaints and I want them, they still need to be absolutely ready for that, but I want them to be focusing on how do we stop it. And we know employers in Australia have that understanding in terms of safety. You're trying to stop the injury. You're not trying to make sure your response is good after someone's injured. Um, it's, it's the same sort of approach. So I feel like we've got the, you know, it's all kind of ready to go. Julie here has a question. Julie Hare from the Australian Financial Review and I'm a director of the National Press Club. Thank you so much for your speech. Uh, the University of New South Wales put out a report earlier a couple of months ago that's found that rather than protect victims of sexual harassment and discrimination, Australia's patchwork system of non-disclosure agreements shields um, serial predators. I'm just like your thoughts on this and what can be done to actually you know, lessen the use of NDAs in these situations. Thank you. So the Respect at Work report did make a specific recommendation that there should be better guidance or there should be guidance on how non-disclosure agreements or confidentiality clauses are used. And I've been working closely with the Attorney General's department to develop that guidance. So it is imminently to be released. Um, uh, we found the same, that um, confidentiality around these issues did three things that worked against getting rid of sexual harassment. One is they did allow people to move from workplace to workplace or even stay in the workplace and continue to harass. But two was it also silenced people who'd experienced harassment where they suddenly found years later they still weren't able to talk about something that had happened to them. And three, it actually hid some of the information that boards needed or leaders needed so they might never know that there'd been issues. So for all the reasons, my belief and the guidance will do this is that there's not, it's not completely, um, it's, we didn't say you should get rid of them altogether. There can be some occasions where they're beneficial, but it shouldn't be the standard and they shouldn't be blanket. There should be nuance around what is kept confidential, for example. So um, I'd encourage you to look out for the guidance that um, I'm looking around the room because it's not entirely my decision, um, but potentially next week we'll be releasing when they're finalised. Thank you. Sarah Eisen. Sarah Eisen from The Australian, thank you so much for your speech. Just on law changes, the ACT is considering law changes to the Evidence Act. That would mean that testimony given by a sexual assault complainant in court could be recorded and deemed admissible in a retrial. This is often to stop, you know, the 
re-traumatisation and so on of sexual assault complainants. Do you think this is a good idea and such law changes are a positive step forwards? And if I could just ask, do you think it's likely that um, parliament or political parties uh, will feel the impact of the positive duty? Obviously, parliament's a pretty complicated place. Uh, do you think that, you know, that these parliamentarians and political parties will be wrapped up in that? Thank you. So the first question was about laws and guidance to help protect uh, victims of possibly sexual assault. So the, the Respect at Work report looked at the experience of um, people who'd experienced sexual harassment giving evidence, and we did make a recommendation to look uh, at the state and territory laws to look at how steps could be made to ensure that the experience doesn't add to the trauma. So from a sexual harassment point of view, we definitely heard sexual harassment is distressing and then often you heard the process, whether it's at court or even in workplaces, that process is really, can be re-traumatising. Um, and that's part of the reason why people are reluctant to complain in, in sexual harassment cases. In terms of the second question, every workplace will be affected by the positive duty However, if you're asking specifically about Parliament, um, Parliament have had a pretty forensic look, at least the federal Parliament and a number of the state parliaments as well. Uh, so my, my observation would be that as we did the work for our Parliament, that our recommendations were firmly with the objective of making sure that the outcome was prevention of sexual harassment, of bullying and sexual assault. So I think that uh, Parliament have started the work that they need to do already. Thank you. Rachel Clune. Uh, Rachel Clun from The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. To stay with Parliament, the Liberal Party is expected to hand down a report onto their, on their election campaign and they're expected to recommend targets rather than a quota for getting more women into seats, about one in five lower house representatives are women. Is that enough and how important is gender equality for preventing sexual harassment in the workplace? Uh, so thank you. I haven't seen any report that might be produced, but I can tell you in the Set the Standard report, we did observe that one of the best protective factors against bullying, sexual harassment, uh, discrimination is a diverse representative work workforce that was inclusive. So recommendation 23 was the one that specifically looked at parliamentarians and the recommendation. And we did recommend that um, political parties develop a 10 year strategy about what they were doing to improve diversity and in particular set targets on gender equality. So um, there's lots of discussion about the language, um, but our conclusion was that that is how you need to get the change. And the reality is um, for political parties, there's a all sides, there's a community appetite around the topics of gender equality, diversity, and I think we're seeing that play out for all sides of politics to consider what they're doing to make sure they're moving with the community sentiment. Thanks. Paul Cup. Thanks very much for your speech. Sorry for the poor turnout from the blokes of the press gallery. Um, <laughs> The Albanese government has uh, removed the cost neutrality provision from the Respect at Work bill uh, for further review by the department. Could I please ask um, how do you think the government have handled that issue and what should happen now to best ensure access to justice? Yes. So the Respect at Work did identify that people who came to us said they found the current system, which is where costs can be awarded against you if you lose your case, was a barrier to people accessing the court system. Um, so there has been a really active engagement about what the recommended change would be to create a, a sort of a less of a barrier to people come in to use the system. Uh, so because of that active discussion, I understand that the attorney has just sent that for further consideration. So I look forward to that changing in due course, um, but I just know that it was so you know, passionately engaged with uh, that he, based on what he's told me, he just wanted to understand it better to make sure that when he makes that change, um, it, it matches the issues that were faced. But does um, the, the complainant and, and the defendant bearing their own costs, do you, do you think that's still the best way to, uh, to ensure access to justice? 
So we made a recommendation that went to that barrier and, um, and it's the recommendation that was in the draft bill, uh, which was based on the Human Rights Commission's consideration as well as my consideration in respect at work. And so it was a model that had parties bearing their own cost, but the court or the judge to be able to make orders in the interests of justice. Thank you. Katina Curtis. Thanks, Katina Curtis from the West Australian. Um, one of the things that I've heard from uh, the domestic and family violence sector, particularly around the new 10-year national plan, is um, that with, with more measures and more encouragement of reporting, the sort of top-line measure of prevalence is probably likely to get worse in the short term. I know you've said you hope that in four years' time the workplace sexual harassment survey will show better numbers, but do you, is there a chance that it could actually get worse because, you know, there's more focus on it, perhaps we'll see more reporting? And would it be better um, or, or a good measure to have maybe Wajia report regularly on or collect data from companies on formal and informal complaints? Thank you for the question. So I'll just distinguish between our prevalence survey, which isn't a survey of reported cases. It's actually an anonymous survey of more than 10,000 people. And so the numbers that we've released today, that one in three Australian workers that um, is still pretty consistent with last time, is actually the um, statistically what we think is actually happening out there. So I don't think that will change. I'll make one rider, which is that statistic I gave you is over five years. And I think because of the active conversation at now, a lot more people have a better understanding of sexual harassment and might remember it. But the, the methodology we use is we don't say, have you been sexually harassed? Because many people would say no. Um, well, we do ask them that. And then we say, have these things happened to you? And the 16 or 17 behaviors Often people will say, no, I haven't been harassed, but yes, I've had unwanted sexual comments made about my body or whatever it might be. Um, so that's firstly the prevalence. In terms of the reporting, um, I understand uh, there's a range of reasons why people fear reporting. I think that workplaces and employers need to improve that. What we heard in the, sex the Respect at Work report was you kind of had nothing or atomic. You're either really go away or you're like we're in a six month investigation and everyone can't talk to each other. So we made recommendations about different reporting options, safe reporting options and not anonymous. So I think from our prevalence survey it will continue to be a really good comparator and it won't be affected in that same way. But reporting numbers for employers, for example, at it, given that only 18% of people told us they reported to someone, even within their organisations or externally, I would hope employers will get a bit of an increase in reporting. So I wouldn't be fearful of that. That usually means people feel, feel safe to speak up. Could I, could I just uh, ask, Kate, um, in terms of complaints made to you, what's the trend been since 2018? Did, did, did formal complaints rise and have they fallen or what's happened? Yes, so at the Human Rights Commission, I won't have the exact number and it's really small compared to what we know the prevalence rate is, but they've been consistently rising with the conversation. So there's no question in the last, um, in the last year or two, we've had a huge increase in complaints related to COVID, unsurprisingly. Uh, we always have a high number of complaints on disability discrimination and the sexual harassment and sex discrimination complaints have also increased over that time. Sarah Tomevska. Thank you so much for your speech, Sarah Tomevska from SBS. I wanted to touch on the findings of the report which show that the prevalence of uh, sexual harassment is the highest in the information media and telecommunications industry. Given that the media has this ability to influence public discourse, but it's also, I suppose, a mirror of what the cultural norms are, how do we as practitioners do better, but how do we influence those cultures when we're operating in an environment that is, you know, as we say, one of the worst workplaces for that practice? 
It's a great question. So as I said at the start of my speech, media have such an important role to play and they've had such an important role to play in the current conversation we're having. One of the reasons why we made the recommendation and Watch have prepared the guidelines is because we observed during the National Inquiry that some media reporting was really helpful and some was actually the exact opposite. It was belittling, it was downplaying, it was saying people are complaining or it was, you know, really um, blaming victims for conduct that happened to them. So that guidance is there to help journalists actually the reporting part but as an industry and a workplace when we did last time was the first time we gathered the industry data and I think uh, that same information media and telecommunications so it's a pretty big industry um, was uh, it was 82% of that industry was um, had experienced sexual harassment. So that was alarming. And some of the reasons why we asked was because with the Weinstein stuff, we were like, is this just a Hollywood thing? And it, I didn't expect media to be one that would emerge to the top. So although I wouldn't um, get too excited, uh, it's now in the 60s, which is terrible compared to the national average, but it looks like there has been a change in that industry. Um, but I would say there's a range of risk factors in that industry, including the competition to get in the industry and uh, factors about how it's organised. Um, but I would just call out to that broader industry to really be focused on doing some work. It cannot be productive or helpful aside from that it's harmful, that people are experiencing sexual harassment, and particularly we know that means diverse people have barriers to progression. Thank you. Thank you. Claudia Long. Hello, thank you for your address today, Claudia Long, ABC News. Um, just looking at today's survey of results, it's highlighted that because the survey is done in English, that that's potentially affecting data about culturally um, and ling linguistically diverse communities and how they're affected by sexual harassment at work. Um, obviously, that data is really important to have. What is the Commission doing to get more data on how sexual harassment is affecting that group? Are you considering doing the survey in languages other than English? Are there things happening now to have this survey be more inclusive potentially? It's a really important question because in the National Inquiry, some of the most devastating stories I heard in the focus groups were um, migrant women who, you know, were in insecure work and, you know, under sort of visa questions. Uh, so in the National Inquiry, one of the recommendations we made was that additional research be done on specific sectors that we were concerned about. So because of the nature of the survey, we haven't been able to capture that. Um, but as a result of one of our other recommendations, Anne Rose, so the Australian National Research Organisation for Women's Safety has funded some research looking at a few different cohorts, including the experience of migrant women. So I'm, I can't recall when that's due out, but I believe it's in the next year. And there has been survey and research work done on that specific issue. Thank you. Olivia Caisley. Olivia Caisley from Sky News. A couple of months ago, I broke a story about a young equestrian who has taken her sexual discrimination complaints to the Human Rights Commission because she says they weren't handled adequately by the National Sporting Body and she was also prevented from taking it to the National Sporting Tribunal because the accused didn't want to participate. I'm sure you can't speak to specific cases, but generally, are you satisfied with the mechanisms in place to protect women and children in sport from sexual harassment and sexual discrimination? And also, do you think that the speed in which complaints are handled needs to happen more quickly? So thanks for that question, and you're right, I can't speak to individual cases, but as I mentioned at the start of the speech, sport has been a key focus for me. And, and part of the reason, it's not just because I'm concerned about sport, but also we know the reach of sport. And in particular, I guess the most notable piece of work was the review that we did into, into gymnastics. My observation on sport as a whole is though the risk factors there are quite uh, consistent. So usually a lot of competition to get through to those elite levels, quite a great deal of control by coaches of, um, of young people and particularly in gymnastics, it was young girls. Um, the sort of history or culture of kind of cruel training and this idea that you will sacrifice things for your achievement. 
and also the federated structures and some of the interesting or you know kind of not ideal mechanisms plus the funding low funding quite often for some of the sports so we often hear about the big sports but smaller sports don't have the resources so my observation is in the time that I've been in this I think sports are beginning to understand I know we have a minister for sport now in Annika Wells who this is one of her top priorities and I also know that since uh, since mid-2020, we've had Sport Integrity Australia. I think when they were established, there was a sense of this is drugs and match fixing, uh, but it was really very quickly, we were doing the gymnastics review, that they realised athlete safety and protecting athletes in sport was part of its core business. And I know David Sharp as the CEO there has been really focused on this. So I think I'm back to that inflection point comment is that I think there are very big risks in sport as a whole because of those risk factors. Uh, but I also think as a country, part of this broader conversation, we're putting in place some systems and structures to make sure that we've got mechanisms that are impartial and able to deal with complaints. And that includes the Human Rights Commission who does consistently get complaints. And Kate, do you feel that um, that has to ha happen at the level of every sport and sort of in those overarching bodies? I mean, how does it, how, at what level is it most effective? Yes, yeah, so I think generally we say you need a couple of options, um, but the observation is because we have so many sports, it's quite difficult for some of the smaller sports. But also if I reflect back what I've heard from athletes who have experienced sexual harassment, sexual assault and abuse, the level of trust in their actual sport is usually very low. If that has happened to you, that sense that this sport can protect me and now it's going to investigate itself. So our observation was the need, that's why people come to the Human Rights Commission. A number of the key pieces of work I've led have been because organisations themselves have said, we need your both trust and your expertise to actually tell us and and you know my comment about secrecy was we never do a piece of work and then say we're not telling anyone so it's always the deal if you're coming to us this is going to be something that the community will hear about so i guess my general comment is um people usually need an independent channel if they've really lost the trust in the sport but that doesn't mean sports shouldn't have really good mechanisms because if you're at your local soccer ground, you don't really want to be going to Sport Integrity Australia. So it's a bit of both. Maeve Bannister. Maeve Bannister from AAP. Thanks for your address. I wanted to ask you about the Parliamentary Standards Committee report that you mentioned. It was released yesterday and it included a draft code of conduct. Um, it was a very comprehensive report, um, but it wasn't clear on the role of the Independent Parliamentary Standards Commission when it comes to investigating uh, historic complaints against MPs. Do you think that the IPSC that you've recommended should be the mechanism for dealing with those issues if they do come up in the future? So a couple of things. One is I have a copy of the report, but I haven't read it all. What I do welcome about that report, this is new territory for the parliament. Uh, the task that we, or that my team gave the parliament was to write some codes of conduct for parliamentarians, for staffers and for their parliamentary workplaces. And to most other workplaces that would not seem radical, but in a parliament, I know staff there have said, the staffers have said, we never thought we would see this. So it's just a fantastic, step forward and I know that committee's been really thoughtful about it. Um, if I go back to set the standard, we did say that that um, independent complaint management system should be able to, should be opened up to be able to listen to current or historic complaints and so that mechanism will be there. I think these are two separate things. If I, and I've worked with the committee, is um, my encouragement was just give us a, you know, get to the draft codes of conduct and then enforcement isn't the next piece of work, but you don't even have kind of what are the, you know, clear standards. In, in theory, everyone knows, but in practice, it's just really good practice for workplaces to have clarity around the standards. So in terms of the complaint management processes, the current um, parliamentary workplace support service will take historic um, inquiries already and they will handle and manage them. So that 
those both those mechanisms are existing. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa Code. Hi, Commissioner. Melissa Code from the Mandarin. You spoke about lessons in pragmatism, persistence and patience from the late Susan Ryan and also you referenced Wendy McCarthy. That's a long time to be patient. <laughs> um, so I guess my question to you is, with hopes of eliciting a bit of advice to the person who succeeds you, what can they do to make sure that the Commission, small and mighty as it is, has better potency and perhaps the pragmatism is better resourced? I feel like we've had some influence, so I'm, I guess I'm starting with questioning that we haven't been uh, uh, influential, even as small as we are. Um, so I would say uh, I, I really, I will welcome who the new commissioner is. I have so loved this role, I cannot even, I cannot even in, I express the privilege and the opportunity to listen to people. Um, and, and to learn and then to decide and find the moment and be ready.